right, good morning. Oh, well, and we are live. Good morning, everyone. I am Ken Shea Tyler Bell. As you already all know, I'm here today happily with Jamal Williams, an educator all around. Um, you can go ahead and check our Instagram for his bio and his in a very small snippet of his story. How are you doing today, Jamal? I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here with you today, Tyler. That's great. I'm very happy to have you here. And um, better yet, I like uh, if it's okay with you throughout the interview. Can I call you Doctor Williams? Is that okay? That's fine with me. <laughs> me Doctor Williams, Mister Williams, Jamal, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, perfect. So we we're just gonna jump in here. That way we both can tend to our little ones. Um. So one of the things I want to do is lay down a foundation with the audience and just ask you, what um, drove you to pursue a career in education? Okay. Well, first, before we get started, thank you for having me on the program, uh, Ken Shea, and um, happy Black History Month to everybody out there that may be listening or may uh, listen later on. Um, my career in education it wasn't like I grew up and wanted to be a teacher my whole life. My career in education came from circumstances. So I had a difficult experience in K-12. Um, never really had a, that teacher at the secondary level in high school that really looked out for me. And I, I was kind of lost in high school. Um, I mentioned to you uh, before we went live that it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree as I, I um, was going through you know, intermittent homelessness and finding myself. Um, but I really felt that had I had somebody to help me uh, in those high school years uh, to mentor me, uh, to, to kind of just give me advice, to tell me what I didn't know, it would have made a difference. And I've seen the difference that uh, education has made for me as far as socioeconomic um, status and the quality of life. Uh, both for me and what I'm able to, to give my family. So uh, I want that for others. I did it. My friends that I went to school with didn't have that. Um, I'm the only one that, that graduated from college. So I would love like during the summer to be able to travel with them and let's go to Hawaii or do something like that. But unfortunately, you know, the way their bank account is set up, that's just not possible. Um, and, it, and it's kind of painful to have to leave behind some of your childhood friends uh, because you were given opportunities that they weren't. And in, in many ways, I feel like it was kind of luck, right? So I don't want luck to be at play for any student. So I'm very passionate about um, um, giving, uh, breaking down barriers and ensuring that uh, students um, that are first generation, low income, uh, black and brown really have a opportunities to, to pursue their dreams um, and, and really have that agency and can, and can go in that direction. And I just want to play a role in breaking down barriers for them. Yeah. And I can say that personally, given that you were first the dean when I was going to um, a school in South Los Angeles, and then you became the, if I remember correctly, vice principal, then principal, if, if I got that right. That's correct. Yeah, and um, and one of the things that I would say to other individuals was like the only person that I trust at at this school with you know actually caring and pushing me forward was you because you proved that every day with the amount of work and and um that you will put in in comparison to to other individuals that were on the staff. And no offense to them, they were doing their best and they were in their in it with their best intentions in mind, but you actually showed that you listened and cared. So I very much appreciate that. And I'm glad you're in our education system trying to make it better. Uh, well, thank you, Ken Shea. And I'm proud of you. I know that, you, like you said, you're on a pause, but you uh, you have a lot of potential and I know that you're going to realize it. So I'm here in your corner um, for the rest of your life. Appreciate that. Thank you. So given that we were speaking about the education system, you have an extensive career already within it and spent, it, and spent a good proportion of your time in the education system as a student as well. So not only creating a career there, but as a student, 
what are some things you have studied in your doctoral program that surprised you about the overall system? Well, there's there's a lot that surprised me. Uh, my my concept, my kind of mental map of the education system has been blown up in my studies. I've had the opportunity to go overseas, Switzerland, Spain, and, and converse with colleagues that were in, um, in Asia to see how they do education. Um, so I, there are a couple of big surprises. I said, the first one is I, I, I wanted to know, I, I left Black High School where I was a principal to go to Harvard because I felt that I didn't have the answers. I wasn't happy with the progress we made. Like we made a lot of progress and we got accolades and all of that, but I wasn't happy with it. And I felt I could be doing more, but I didn't know what I could be doing. Mm. And so one of the things I learned at Harvard was, no, you really can't do more. Like it's a collective impact thing. You, um, as, a, as a school, you have a, a responsibility uh, and, um, and we could have done more. I almost say I couldn't have done more. We could have been more efficient and done things better, but you also need the support of the community, of nonprofits, of businesses, of families, um, and of the, of the city, mm. of the state, you know, of the federal government, everybody working together and moving in the same direction. I look at the, the funding that the federal government gives to education, and it's, it's, it's rather small. And the reason for that that I was given is that, you know, there, there's a lot of money that's spent on, on the military. We have to spend a lot of money on health care. Health care is one of the most inefficient in the world. Um, and Social Security and these things. So then you have to make an economic decision. Um, OK, what what are we going to cut? And it, it usually ends up being education because you're not going to cut somebody's Social Security you know, when they're when they're they need that money to survive. You're not going to cut health care when they need that money to survive in education, even though. I would argue that you need that money, like by not supporting that system, the long term impact is is, is just as dire, but. Um, because it's not right in your face, it tends to, to be put on the back burner uh, with politicians, you're not going to get. Uh, elected by um, really um, putting uh, education up as your platform because it's long term. Um, so that was a surprise for me. Yeah. Um, that, that's the the biggest surprise. And then uh, there's just the I, I won't get into the differences between the, our system and the system overseas because I think there are other questions that uh, will allow me to speak to that. Yeah, so we we will get to that a little in the future. But um, as someone who is, well, is going back to school um, for their degree in government, so not only just like the political sciences, but in, but in government, um, you're very much correct. A lot of the way of thinking is very, well, we can't cut here and here and here just because of, you know, that's, that's our lives being put in danger or that's um, making it harder for other people to survive where, like you said, I will argue that if you're not giving people the proper education and within a society system, then your society is going to fall apart and therefore people's lives will be in danger. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. I digress. Another, <laughs> well, another one that I, maybe the, the biggest travesty I, that I didn't mention is the prison system, especially in California, right? We're spending so many billions of dollars on our, our prison to incarcerate. You know, you can educate or you can incarcerate. And we're spending, by not spending the money on the front end, we're spending it on the back end. Because now we're saying, okay, they don't have skills to survive, so they're forced. You know, like Tupac said, my stomach hurts, so I'm looking for a purse to snatch. We have this homeless situation here in LA that is, it, it is just, it's unconscionable. And it's, it is the fault of the leaders. We have to to um, prepare these people to be able to make a living so that they don't have to feel so defeated that they're on drugs and they're committing crimes. And then we have to incarcerate them and spend all the money on incarceration that we could have been spending on educating them in the first place. So uh, we definitely need to make some big changes. Yes. And um, that actually can lead us into question three here where 
many studies have shown that across the board, black slash African American students are at the lowest levels in education, and this is considering the United States system. Um, in your own professional opinion, what are so, uh, some of the causes of this? Uh, it's institutional racism over time, just baked into all of our systems. So it's not just in education, right? You can do the, the same study and look at the outcomes of, of African-Americans when it comes to life expectancy, mm -hmm. uh, earnings, any, take your pick, right? It's, uh, it's built into the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we often refer to it as an achievement gap, which I really despise. And, and um, I'm very happy that I've, a lot of people are starting to change that. You know, the summer uh, of um, unrest really put it on people's minds for the first time, even though it's been going on for centuries that, oh crap, you know, um, there's something wrong here. And so I refer to it as the opportunity gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's, I'm about just, what do we need to do to break down barriers for African-American students and give them opportunities to achieve? Because it's not that white kids are inherently more intelligent, right? We, that's all been disproven. Um, but yet that and still things like that, per, people still believe that they might not say it in those words, but they have this feeling that, oh, you know, that's to be expected, you know, and, and they would make an excuse for it. So I think uh, we break down barriers, some of the, the biggest barriers and not in a black people are a very diverse group. Um, I, I, I can't speak for all black people. But a, a common barrier for uh, black people that are in poverty is that that's the barrier, right? If I'm if I'm coming to school and I'm competing with a white child, and that white child has um, support at home because the, the mom doesn't have to work, so the mom can help educate. If that child uh, is not um, facing any um, potential trauma that might come from growing up in in a, in a situation that is not as safe for them, both physically and psychologically. If that child um, doesn't have to go to school and then deal with stereotype threats, all of these things are making it more difficult for the African-American student to compete with the white student. If 80% of school teachers are white, you know, you're gonna have some of those Susans or whatever the ones you're seeing on the news that are calling a the police on black people, right? That's not all of them, but there's some of those in the classroom and uh, and, and black students are, are having to deal with these, these threats and that takes away some of the cognitive um, firepower that you have to solve a math equation mm. because you're worried that, wow, this, this teacher doesn't believe in me or I'm the only black kid in the classroom or I'm not, you know, I'm not, prepared you know, there's other things on the on the child's mind that are preventing them from really fully engaging in that education yes and um this this brings um me to a point that makes me realize that um when you when and you maybe can speak to it when when working with uh, students in the inner city. Um, how important is it for the school, meaning the faculty and staff members, to engage with the community, given that that's a major barrier for a lot of these students? Yeah, I'll speak. But before I get to this one, uh, I want to bring up an example of what I was just talking about. Yeah. If you look at HBCUs, Students who attend HBCUs, if you look at them 10 years down the road, they have better outcomes than students that attend PWIs or primarily white institutions. Meaning if I go to Howard, I'm gonna be better off than if I go to UCLA as a black man. And there, the reasons for this are a lot of what I just talked about. When you go to an HBCU and I didn't, but my wife did and a lot of my colleagues uh, did, um, they talk about the experience as being very empowering you don't have to worry about being the only black kid and representing all black people while you're in the classroom during the discussions. Um, you, you learn to um, carry yourself in a certain way and to take pride in who you are and what you're capable of. Um, so there are no stereotype threats um, and they're really, they build the students up and you see professional educators that look like you day in and day out that you don't see when you're in the, in the traditional public system. And the result of that is better outcomes for students. So that's kind of a, an example of what I was talking about. 
uh, to your point about you know what how important is it for um, for schools in inner cities to 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 have uh, strong relationships with the family and community to me it's everything mm -hmm. I, like that's you don't and it's not just inner cities I would say any school but you should not if you don't think that's important then I wouldn't hire you to work at, at a school that I was running, mm. you know, and that's, it's not always a, that simple, but that's how, it, how much I believe in it. You know, that's one of my, my foundational pieces. Uh, one of the um, um, world renowned uh, specialists on this, Dr. Karen Mapp, uh, I studied under her at Harvard and, and she has a, um, a framework and it's the dual capacity building framework. And she talks about, you have to build the teacher's, capacity to really engage and build a strong relationship with the with the student and the family and you also have to build the family's um, ability to engage with the teacher and build that relationship um, and so she has that uh, frameworks available is actually um, during Obama administration was adopted by the um, the federal uh, government's uh, Department of Education um, but that's that's what I believe, Kensha. It, it means everything. Like this is, it takes a village um, to raise a kid. And when you're in inner cities, especially, and you're dealing with the, some of the other issues we've been talking about, um, some of those other obstacles. If you have a team working at it together, and the kids can can accomplish anything. There's nothing stopping them. But uh, you got to go about it uh, as a cohesive unit. Yeah, and uh, and I I can first-hand encounter and being in seeing you as my principal and uh seeing how the school functioned once you became principal that was very inherent that the community was a very versatile and important part of of our school um and that came down from you and pushing us to do more and, and engage with the community more so that helped me out a lot and, and it made me get more engaged and in tune with what was going on in my own community and allowed me to do it too. <laughs> yeah. But the school is there to me. That's the purpose of the school is there for the community. Like we, I'm not, I don't go into, into Watts and, and, and bring my own, like, this is what I think these kids need to learn and they need to, you know, so that they can go to college or no, I, I come in like, what do our kids need to learn? What is, what is it that, that we need in our community, um, and then we do this together, right? It's not it's not about oh, you know, I, I hear college for all and all of that stuff, but it, that decision needs to be made with families. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's that's an amazing um, point there, just bringing in the family and engaging in the community. Therefore, a lot of these issues that inner city students have to face and deal with, um, they're not going to disappear, but they get a little bit more easier to combat every day, especially when you're not having to deal with them on your way to school all the time. Um, yeah. But there's more issues that plague the American education system. So in your opinion, what are some of the biggest issues that the American education system face? And what are some things, if any, we should adopt from other countries to better our system? Yeah, so I, I think the number one uh, issue is, and I, I, I told you I traveled to um, Switzerland. And while I was there, we were looking at their, um, their system of education and they they are they're really coherent coherence is the word that the, is the biggest problem with the united states system and the and the, the head of the switzerland system told me so much she was not she was borderline you know like she was talking bad about it <laughs> but she was um but, but you know like she she was wasn't meaning to right but yeah. she was just telling facts right and what we we're not on the same page in america in in a country like switzerland the federal government is working with the individual you know if they call them states or um areas and they're on the same page and then they're working with the businesses and they're on the same page and then they're working with the local schools and they're everybody is working together there's one plan uh for the whole system um and so they have a um I'm losing my work and shape for what they call it, apprenticeship mm. system. So if you 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 leave uh, junior high and you go into high school and you decide, you know what, I want to be a plumber. Well, they have a, a track for you. You're still going to get the, all of these basic skills to where if you decided, 
you know, 11th grade, I don't want to be a plumber anymore. I want to go to college. You can make that switch. Um, but they can allow you to go into a, 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 um, the apprenticeship to become a plumber. You'll get that training. So when you graduate, you'll be able to move into that career. Um, but they don't have an issue with, okay, we have 10,000 kids that want to be a plumber, but we only have 1,000 jobs because they're all working together. The government is working with businesses to see, okay, how many of these jobs are you going to need in the future so that every, they're not producing too much of one thing. Uh, that's something that we do here in America. There's a lot of history degrees or, or something like that, and, and students don't really um, have support, I think, in thinking through what are you going to do with that history degree? Mm. How are you going to pay off that th those student loans um, with a degree that may not necessarily uh, have the, the value that you want it to have? So I think coherence, and, and it's hard Switzerland's the size of Colorado. It's not yeah. nearly as big big is, is uh, America, right? So it'd be difficult. Mm -hmm. But what we have right now is we have the federal government, uh, and they want to do one thing, and then you have 50 states who all do their own thing. Yeah. And then you have within those 50 states, you have tens of thousands of school districts who all do their, you know, not not their own thing, but they all, you know, there's just not enough coherence in the system. So uh, bringing that coherence, and it may have to be at the state level, but uh, um, an increased uh, level of um, being on the same page and having a common playbook and, and moving towards those same goals would move a long way towards helping us achieve uh, our goals. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, there's many conversations, especially with the degree that I'm seeking about education and our education system as a whole, especially now more people are aware that it is not the best because um, mm -hmm. we are now looking outside of the U.S. We're, we're searching for answers now more so than ever and than we have ever before. We're more willing mm -hmm. to listen to these other states um, by other states. I mean, like government yeah. systems <laughs> um, than ever before. And I, I had a conversation with a friend about our education system and how it automatically deemed me a failure before it even decided to help me find a job. And it still hasn't mm -hmm. helped me find a job. It just deemed me a failure. And once I made it past third grade, didn't realize, oh, he probably does still have potential. Then eighth grade, oh, he still has potential. Then ninth grade, mm -hmm. okay, now we can help him. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how the system at least worked for me where that's where mm -hmm. I started to see all of these um, reading classes come into play and being adopted broadly and not just placed in certain parts of um, – our school system. So just witnessing that as a, as a student is, it's amazing. To, to yeah. And that's, and that's also that you, you went from an LAUSD to green dot and green dot has the, um, the double blocking for math and, and reading classes. If you're behind, once you get to the high school level, Yeah, which I'm not, I'm, I'm torn about that. Right. Because you can double block a kid, but if, if students are already not that big of a fan of school to begin with, and now you say, okay, no band, no art class, go to English for two more hours. You know, you take some of the joy out of learning. So really, for me, it's figuring out how to infuse um, uh, ELA and writing into that art class or into, into band or into some of these others, which isn't easy, but I've just, it, it's a tough call for me, like to, to take away some of the joy from school, but I understand the need to, to make sure students are graduating uh, literate. Yeah. And um, it is just one of those double edged swords there, for most yeah. definitely. <laughs> In regards to the United States education system, there's always this phrase that's being pushed around. And I'm, I'm a student who, I was the last generation of um, track schools, if you remember track schools, where there were track A, B, and C, and then A was on for three months and then go off and then B goes on. So I'm the last generation of that. And um, School to Prison Pipeline it was really big in, during that system. Can you explain more of what that phrase means? Uh, it's really the school system being part another arm of the of the government that is uh, putting uh, minority students on a path towards incarceration. Hmm. So, if you look at Locke, and this was one of my 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 issues, right? I felt like we weren't doing enough to disrupt that pipeline, and I and I think 
there's nothing wrong with the organization green dot that was running it or what we were doing again i feel like it's collective impact we need support from the city and, and all of those things but if if uh if students are being um suspended at, at ridiculous rates um and they're and, and we push them out we know that research shows when you suspend a kid their chances of, of not graduating dramatically increase when they don't graduate, their chances of ending up in prison dramatically increase. And so those are things that are that lead to a school to prison pipeline. If you have a school where you are suspending kids at high rates and kids are not graduating at high rates, you are operating a school to prison pipeline school, um, unfortunately. And then again, you, you have to disrupt that and, and uh, by breaking down barriers and looking at different ways that you can meet the needs of those of those students. Some of them are education based. Others are like see a man, be a man based, mm -hmm. right? Because that program is not um, focused on um, increasing literacy or improving mathematical skills. The hope is that that might be a, um, a secondary byproduct of it, but it's really focused on um, mentoring and, and, and learning and just having knowledge drops and in and, and, and learning to love who you are as a black man and these types of things i think can help to disrupt that school to prison pipeline um, but that's uh what it is and what uh and, and what, how to address it um, needs to be a multifaceted plan oh, wow. and um that's something that li having mentors seems like it, it's a good um break in that system especially when they can mentor you and, and guide you in a positive way which some of our first mentors is our parents so how important is it for parents to be a part of their child's um, education and is there any connection between students doing good in school and their parents being involved um, with their schooling yeah there certainly is a connection between uh, student performance and parent involvement um, so I will say that parents have a role to play, but again, that role is in concert with the school, with the teachers uh, building that relationship, like I mentioned with the, the dual capacity framework. So some parents are going to be able to lend more assistance than other parents. If, if you're in a household where you have a single mother that's working her butt off, she's not going to be able to do all of the things that a suburban mother who doesn't work is going to be able to do to support her child's education mm -hmm. and that's where uh, you know we need to be in communication with the school and the parents to make sure that any gaps are being filled and those barriers are being addressed so i think um, the parents definitely have a role to play and research does show that um, parents can um, improve outcomes uh, be it by you know working with students at home in elementary and reading with them or advocating for them in secondary saying, I don't want my son um, doesn't need to be in this uh, special education classroom out, out of the general population. He is, um, he is fully capable of, um, of, of learning and that if we give him the proper supports, he can be successful. That advocating is something that a, a parent can do for their child that is, uh, that's important. Yeah, and um, one, of the, one of the things that I will add to that is just in my own personal experience, um, especially with having my learning disability, which I'm, I'm, I'm dyslexic for everyone watching, so that way you can follow a little easier. Um, that was suggested to my mother when I was in about the eighth grade, so I didn't get tested for my dyslexia throughout the whole entire, my entire education system in elementary and parts of middle school until eighth grade, and it was a month before I was graduating, which is hysterical but the band director pushed for it he uh he explained to me what what it would what it would mean he gave me um resources on why he believed it would benefit me um and he talked to my mom about it they went ahead and did did tests and found that i was dyslexic and that was part of the reason why i was slowing down and in, in schooling and why things were harder for me to do and they suggested that when I move forward and into high school that they, that she should look for putting me into special education classes. And my mom explained um, just how it wouldn't benefit me in, in its entirety if I already proved that I can make it in all of these other classes. I was I um, it was one, two, three, four, you know, in in elementary. And I was able to succeed at the last stretch of it. And then. 
in uh, middle school, I was able to prove that I, I could test and get into classes like Avid, if anybody remember that system. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> this really having my mom advocate on that level for me really meant a lot. And she also advocated for a couple of other things like in question eight here, it talks about black students are more likely to be suspended, expelled or arrested in in or from schools than other students, even in schools where they're the minority. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I, I'm very talkative. I, I speak my mind a lot, especially when it comes to teachers and, <laughs> and giving my opinion on certain topics. Um, you may have heard of these stories. So uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to 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 um, add into this and um, ask if there is any studies that uh, explains uh, why that um, black students are more likely to be suspended, expelled, or arrested in and from schools. Okay. Um, I'll go, I'm going to uh, close the loop on the, on the special education thing because I have okay. some some thoughts on that. And first one is there is there are no there is no research that indicates that pulling a kid out of a general education pro, um, classroom and putting them into a small classroom, an SDC classroom, is beneficial to that student. Wow. Any possible benefits you might get are are overrun by the fact that when you do that, you lower the expectation for the student, and there are social um, costs to that. Right. Mm -hmm. The kids, their own sense of self being like, oh, I'm not I'm not up to the level to be in the in general ed classroom. So I'm a proponent of doing away with that. And let's put the kids into the um, the general ed classrooms. There shouldn't be a, a side in some other classroom. Now, to do that, teachers need support training. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I'm not suggesting that. But I think it's the right thing to do. That's what I'm suggesting, because I think for ultimately for student outcomes, uh, high expectations and belief is is, is, is foundational. Mm. Right. And so uh, I, I would keep them in there and challenge them. So I'm glad that's the, the route that you took. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, as far as the, the second problem, uh, can you uh, restate it again? Yeah. Um, so we've seen many studies come out and explain that black students are more likely to be suspended, expelled, and are arrested um, mm -hmm. and in from schools that they're the minority at. Can like, Even <clears throat> at schools where they're the minority. Can we explain why this is the case? Is there any way to mm -hmm. explain these studies? Yeah. I mean, I think if you, you read the studies, it's got a lot to do with implicit bias. Mm -hmm. Right. In the way that uh, if statistically 80 percent of teachers are white, you know, in in the in the inner city, a school like Locke, that that statistic doesn't hold up. It's not 80 percent white, but it's certainly a higher percentage than the student population. Mm -hmm. And it's just human nature that we are more easily form relationships with people that are like us. Right. So if we have a similar background, similar um, culture, um, we look like each other, it's going to be a more I'm going to more readily uh, form a relationship with you and be less likely to see you as an other and then uh, try to punish you because of that. Mm. So that's, uh, I think, what's underlying those things. The reason that uh, African-American students are 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 getting more trouble or suspended is because they uh, I don't know if I want to call it racism, but it's certainly implicit bias mm. uh, that is leading to that. So they can do, and they've done studies, they could have the exact same behavior and uh, the black student is going to be punished for a behavior that the white student would not be punished for because they're seen as, oh, they're aggressive or, oh, they're, they're an adult and black students should behave because they're seen as being much older than they are, black women, black girls too. Um, they're expected to behave at a level that white kids aren't because white kids are seen as kids and black kids are seen as men and women. So that's what some of the studies have shown. Yeah. And um, I asked that question after the question about how involved parents um, should be and how important is it and uh, because of the advocacy, you know, a lot of times when students are sent to the principal office, not in your case, you actually do listen, which is, <laughs> which, which is, I'm happy that I can actually say that without, you know, trying to hype you up or anything like I actually mean mm -hmm. that. But in, in a lot of cases, that's, you know, that's not the same situation for, for many students. Um, 
you know, how how much and how should a parent go about advocating for their student when it comes to being expelled or, or um, being disciplined in a way that just doesn't seem to fit the scenario or the, the situation? Yeah, I think um, this is a question I haven't thought a lot about, but I, I'm thinking there are probably advocacy groups out there that could help parents advocate for their student. Mm. Uh, certainly, if if a student in the CMAN, BMAN program was suspended or expelled, those parents could talk to, to one of the mentors, you know, Tori or Johnny, and I know for a fact that they would support them and, and help them advocate. Yes. Um, and they're, they're not the only ones. There are plenty of other uh, nonprofit groups that can, can help advocate. There may be teachers at the campus. Um, you may... Um, no others that might be able to support you. But if you are a parent and you, you can certainly advocate on your own, you don't need uh, somebody else. I think one of the biggest mistakes <clears throat> parents made when advocating for their students, in my experience, was that they would come in hot, mm. right? And, uh, and I, for me, like, I don't, I'm very even killed, right? So they could come in and start cussing at, at, at me and then we could kind of re- we could write the situation and make it maybe get to a place where I'm actually going to listen to what they say. But very few people are. Once you, if you come into a situation and you just come in attacking and insulting, um, you're going to turn that person off and they're going to become your enemy. Mm -hmm. So the, the principal might have been open and open to hear what you had to say, but if you approach it in, in a, an unprofessional manner, they're going to write you off as, oh, they're going to pull the stereotypes out that they have. Oh, this is just a ghetto, ignorant person and uh, they don't know what they're talking about. And that's why their kid acts this way too, you know? So I would try to avoid that, um, but then doing other things, finding others to help you advocate. Yeah. Okay, well, the, here's the important part of the, of the conversation. So what solutions can you offer to schools and administrations that are hoping to help improve their african Americans slash black students' performance? Because you have actually done it, and in, in, in research shows that you have done it at Locke High School. So can you, do you have any information about how to go about it for these um, individuals? Yeah, I mean, I think... So I was the principal, right? And if you have a principal that is really values equity and wants to make sure that all students have the opportunity to succeed, that you're at the top at the school level, right? And so that person can really um, have the power to uh, implement policies and different things that make that happen. So as principal, we, we got a lot more um, African-American teachers at Lock High School while I was there, mm. which is one of the reasons uh, I think that um, students started to um, to perform better, because you know with the, with African American teachers you're more readily able to develop those relationships, um, and they uh, they're seeing uh, somebody that looks like them that is successful, um, and uh, and they and they were on the on the same page with me as what with what we wanted to accomplish. Mm. That being said, there were some great white teachers, Asian teachers, uh, uh, Latinx teachers that were the same way. So it's not just getting black teachers. If I can get a, a really good white teacher that uh, cares about uh, dealing with the opportunity gap and, and uh, making sure we break down barriers for black students, and then I get a, a black teacher, which I had a few of them at lock, um, I'm going to take the white teacher every time, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just about race, but having a uh, students being able to see somebody that looks like them is a support but i think it all starts at the principal level you have to have a leader that believes in that that believes that the that that black students are inherently equal mm. to other students and they're inherently uh, capable of of you know reaching their hopes and dreams just like any other student and if they have that foundational belief then they look at, at data and they look at what's happening at their school and they see discrepancies and it's a problem. It's not just like, oh, this is what it is. You know, black students never perform as good as white students. No, they look at it and they say, what's wrong? What's happening here? And what are we going to do about it? 
So I think it's that, that having an advocate for students at the school level that uh, has an eye on that and is always is monitoring it to see what's going on. Like I pulled data on my, I knew that my, I think it was my first year as principal that only 25% of the African-American students at my school were on pace to graduate. And that's, that's boys, not girls. The girls were doing better. Um, but that's something I'm aware of. And now that I'm aware of it, what are we going to do about it? And I, you know, I'd bring this up in, in uh, assemblies with the kids and um, trying to just rally everybody around it. You know, what are we going to do? And the numbers did go up after afterwards. I'm correct, right? The numbers started to perform and move yeah. forward and we had it, high graduation it, rate. <laughs> yeah, well, the numbers, the numbers improved. But as I mentioned, you know, earlier in the interview, I the reason I, I, I left Locke and went to Harvard is because I didn't know what move to make next to take it to the next level. Mm. Right. So I thought I needed to learn more. And I, and I did learn more and I learned, uh, I have a skill set that if I were to go back as principal, I would do a better job as principal, but I would also spend a lot of time uh, trying to build relationships with the city um, and with nonprofits and with, uh, with corporations in the Los Angeles area to really help them understand like this is, it's not, it's not a, a, a school problem, it's a community problem. If we're all in this together, and we can solve it together, but I can't solve it by myself at the school. As a corporation, you can't solve the fact that you can't get, you know, the workers from the community that you need, you know, by yourself. And as a city, you can't uh, solve that you don't have the tax base you would like to have because you're, you have so many unemployed people in the city. You can't solve that by yourself. But if we all work together, if the city can help me make sure that my students can get to and from school safely, and if the state can make sure that we have we are giving a, a living wage, you know, they pass legislation to go to fifteen dollars an hour in Los Angeles. If we can do things like that to to lower the poverty threshold in the community, things are going to get better. Mm -hmm. And um, to all of my uh, individuals who may be across the aisle from my way of thinking, um, just to explain to you that is not socialism. It still opens a free market, a free and willing working market, and more likely to have the workers that are necessary for jobs that are we're moving towards in our twenty, uh, moving towards our what the twenty second century. Um, we will have the education necessary for that if we start to move in this path. Uh, so. With that, hypothetically, you're given full control of the United States education system. What is something you're for sure getting rid of that just happens within the system? And what is something that you're for sure adding uh, or approving upon? So the, the first thing is we talked about it, coherence, mm. right? So how can we... Uh, get on the same page so that as, as a federal government, I'm supporting what you're doing in all 50 states um, and we're working on the same page. So it's not like I'm doing this and you're doing that. It's like you're doing this and I'm helping you do that. Mm -hmm. So one thing, for example, it's like special education. The federal gov government mandates it that you have to offer these services, but they don't fund it. Mm -hmm. And so it's chronically underfunded and, uh, and the students don't uh, get the outcomes that we want. So I guess if I was going to mandate something, I would blow up no, first of all, we'll fund special education, but you're not going to um, put them in separate classrooms. We're going to mainstream people because when you put them in separate classrooms, you create others um, and people are uh, uncomfortable with others. Um, something I would do, I think I would, I would make mandatory um, DEI training is a, a big buzzword, diversity, equity, inclusion, but this needs to be mandatory. Anybody that is uh, teaching our students um, needs to, uh, to have a, uh, an understanding of the implicit bias and prejudices that they hold and how they can impact students and then what they can do to ensure that they're not uh, bringing that on. And then finally, I would make it a federal law that all schools have to teach um, ethnic studies mm. k-12 so the the history curriculum is going to be blown up and we're going to learn about all the different cultures uh, that are present in the united states so not just an ethnic studies class in high school 
uh, as you're going through K-12 and you're learning about these events, you're going to learn about all the different groups and cultures and how it impacted them. I think uh, knowing yourself and understanding your history is a, is a big deal in, uh, in identity development and students' um, self-worth. And so I would mandate that. Okay. So um, what's next for Dr. Williams? Once you, once you finish the program at uh, Harvard uh, University, get your, your doctorate, uh, what, is, what is your hopes and, and goals after that, if you don't mind me asking? No, I don't mind. I, um, so I told you my, my understanding of the education landscape has really been expanded since being at Harvard. I know there are jobs that you can you can take in the um, advocacy uh, world, or policy. You know, trying to change the policies, like I just mentioned, with ethnic studies and um, jobs and um, funding uh, and grants and all of that stuff. I think for me, I want to move into district level leadership and work with principals and train principals, support principals, because I think the principalship is the is a key lever that if you can get a high level principal in each school who is paying attention to data related to uh, equity and related to the school to prison uh, gap and related to college um, um, acceptance and college preparation, um, you can you can really move the needle. If I can, if we can have more Jamal's uh, be principal, not to say Jamal is the best principal, but more people that were thinking like me and had a mind towards equity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, that would uh, make a difference for kids. Yeah, and um, as one of those students, I, I can guarantee that it will make a difference. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here with us today and giving us all this information. Um, there is a lot of work needing to be done, and it's not just um, – Dr. Williams working on it, but there's a collective in it of individuals, as you heard from us this Black History Month. You have Dr. Rains, Mr. Tory, all experts in different categories of their field, but still revolves around education. So we have a lot to do to move forward, but you have the people here to do it, especially if you're a young black male, if you're a young black woman. Um, there is hope there are individuals out there trying to make this possible for you so any words of encouragement before you go dr williams yeah you you are powerful you know black boys and black girls have the the ability to achieve anything they want right second to none and uh and it's um it's our job to make sure that we uh, break down barriers and just create the path so that they can move forward they'll do it we just need to uh, create the space for them to do it. Well, thank you for that. And um, I appreciate all the work you have done and all the work you are going to do. I look forward to hopefully in the future, once I get my degrees going and I'm running for different positions in elected office, that you can be my expert on the education system and uh, really help me and I help you push the system forward into a better place. So thank you so much once again. Hey, my pleasure, Ken Shay. Uh, Say hi to your uh, girlfriend and, and little girls for me. And uh, it was a pleasure getting, catching up with you. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Little girl and boy, I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew what you meant. <laughs> I will tell him what you said. He, he might not appreciate it. <laughs> Have a great one. <laughs> Are you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. As you've seen, that was Dr. Williams. Sorry, I'm so small on the screen. I got to blow myself up here. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, This is number three of four interviews, so if you want to know, if you want to hear more, and you want to learn more, if you want to be a part of more of the conversation, please feel free to follow us on our social media platforms. Feel free to check out our website, and especially check out our YouTube channel, which has the previous episodes posted. Um, if you want more information about me, myself, and what I do, you can for sure find that on our website, periodityentertainment.com. And thank you once again for participating with the, um, in this live stream. Um, is there anything else that I wanted to add? No, that's about it. There's one more interview coming up, and it's a very special one. It, it, it ties everything all together from the, so we have someone who was a Black Panther um, civil rights activist 
who talked about his pathway into creating a better future for black and black black and brown individuals. Then you have Mr. Tory who explained his program for directly impacting black males and helping them through the education system and went through his mentor program and mentorship um, along with actually, uh, helping black women, young black women as well. Then you have, then, then you have now Jamal Williams, Dr. Jamal Williams, who explained his um, process within the education system and how he viewed um, his role as a principal to better the connection and growth uh, in education with black and brown students. And then finally, we have a community advocate. This interview will be coming up Wednesday. So please stay tuned on our social media platform to learn more about who that individual is and what they do within the community. Thank you all for all your support. We appreciate it very much. Hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any questions for Dr. Williams, feel feel free to reach out to us through our website in the contact us um, section. Email us your questions and then we'll forward them to Dr. Williams. Um, and that goes the same for Dr. Johnny Rings and with, as well as Mr. Uh, Torrance Brandon Reese. So thank you all again. Hope you're happy. Hope you're safe and have a good one.